I tell you, I'm really excited. A lot of cool things are happening, and the Spirit of God is moving right across the United States of America. There is sound of revival breaking out everywhere. I just recently, in fact, two days ago, talked with Dr. Tom Renfro, who lives up in the Appalachian Mountains. Uh, many of you know Dr. Tom. He preached only a few weeks ago here. And he told me that up there in one of the Bible colleges, in one of the colleges, a Christian college, the students had chapel, and they are now going 14 days nonstop having church. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. Revival is just breaking out everywhere, and we say, come Holy Spirit, break out in the midst of us as well. Can I get an agreement? Yeah. You know, I, I came into the prayer meeting Friday morning. We have prayer uh, Monday, uh, Tuesday morning, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday from 9 to 10, 1030. And then, of course, Sunday morning, Pastor Jan heads up prayer meeting next door. I would encourage everybody, man, if you want to continue to see a move of the Holy Ghost, before you come to this meeting, go to the prayer meeting, join Pastor Jan. And then the ladies also, well, it's not just ladies, it's open to anybody. They have a prayer meeting Tuesday nights. But I came into the prayer meeting Friday morning and I said, Pastor Jan, get ready, get ready. Everything you've been praying for, everything we've been praying for is about to unleash and uh yeah yeah so we have our prayer meeting we're, we're chit-chatting we're praying we're talking about things praying again and uh, an hour later i get a phone call from a young man that i led to the lord him and his wife they were on the verge of divorce he wasn't saved it was a good little catholic but he never really gave his life over to jesus and uh anyway long story short they uh, got born again, baptized in the Holy Ghost, uh, did 18 months of marriage counseling on their lives. They now have six kids. They run two daycare centers, a uh, Christian elementary school, middle school, and high school. So he rang me an hour after the prayer meeting or after we had started. He says, Pastor Rob, you got to come up here. Something beautiful has happened. I said, I know. So the Holy Spirit broke out in your chapel. He said, yes, had you know? I said, it's happening all over the United States of America. The Spirit of God is moving. And uh, so I said, what's happening? He said, well, uh, we, we're having chapel, and we got the kids to start praying. We were singing, uh, I need you, oh, every hour I need you. And kids started breaking down, weeping, they started praying. They started praying for each other. The staff started having words of knowledge over the children and ministering to them. These are teenagers, sorry. I should have said children, young adults. And uh, they did not want to leave. The kids are making groups and sitting down on the, uh, uh, in circles on the floor, and they're praying for each other. And so Pastor Jan and I jumped in the car, and we went up there, and... Uh, uh, we got the opportunity a little later. They had a bit of a break. Sometimes schools are just so into the routine of, okay, we got this next thing. But they called all the students back again, and there was such a sweet, sweet spirit. This is a very, very special moment in the United States of America. Something similar to this broke out 50 years ago it's called the Jesus Revolution. Our nation was in a very bad place morally, spiritually, politically. It was in a bad place. And I don't say that to infer that there's one right political team or another right political team. The only team I'm putting my money on is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. We need a Jesus team, and the best team that can comprise of a Jesus team is when the church of Jesus Christ stops just having church and they start to get honest, they start to get real, they start to deal with issues in their lives that honestly need to be dealt with. We start cleaning up our act and we start making God number one in our lives. Are you with me? Absolutely. 
God will never be number two. He will never be number two. And neither God has first place in your life or he has no place. You think about this. Do you honestly think that the king of the universe is going to sit in your life while you make him second or third or fourth? God will always be first. And if we want God to have his way in our lives and in our church, our agendas have to change. And we need to line up with God's divine order or we will always be in an unholy demonic disorder. Can I get an agreement here? Amen. That was very nice. Can I get a violent agreement? Now that's the church that I expect to preach to. I don't want you to be nice. I want you to be wild. Two years ago, the Holy Spirit put it on my heart, and if you go through the archives of our videos, you'll see I did a whole series about revival two years ago. God impressed on me to teach people what is revival. And so I went through the last uh, 100 years here in the United States, and we had two great awakenings here in America, and I described some of the revivals and some of the things that took place. And then I ended by coming to the Jesus movement, the revival that took place in the late 1960s to the early mid-1970s. It was two revivals that overlapped, the Jesus movement and the charismatic renewal. It not only broke out in America, both of these revivals went around the world. My parents were pastors in Australia at the time. We experienced the revivals in Australia. This was a worldwide move of God. Listen to me. If you're not familiar with these things, every so often... The Spirit of God, when the world is going absolutely crazy, God presses a reset button. He presses that button in response to the prayers of saints who are crying out and saying, God, this is getting messy and this is getting crazy. And God will pour out in response to the prayers that have been prayed up around the earth. He pours out his Spirit and suddenly it's like this gigantic bath in the Holy Ghost. Yeah. And so there's been two great, history calls them two great awakenings here in America. I started preaching this two years ago. We've had uh, one of our ladies kept hearing outbreak. There's going to be a spiritual outbreak. Pastor Jan had a dream about eight months ago, I think, maybe a little longer, that we were going to a prayer meeting. We were walking up a hill and the, the auditorium was packed with hundreds of people, hundreds and hundreds, correct? Am I exaggerating? So much so, she couldn't see the end of the crowds that she said, do these people realize it's a prayer meeting? Because the first meeting that you don't want to attend when you start to live from the flesh is a prayer meeting. If Pastor Rob can preach up a storm and jack it up a little bit and jump on chairs, people will come out and say, man, that was cool. That was fun. But a prayer meeting takes another step or another dimension of dying to yourself. Yeah, I am. I'm giving them time to get it. And so she says, Do, does everyone realize this is a prayer meeting? And someone from the crowd yelled out, yes, that's why we're here. She was so excited the next day in our morning prayer meeting when she shared the dream. And uh, 10 weeks ago, I walked into the prayer meeting. I said, guys, I just had a dream that there was a sovereign move of God and revival is about to hit us. That's before Asbury, 10 weeks ago. Asbury now, I think it's four, four weeks ago it took place and it's still happening in colleges 
Christian colleges and campuses all over America are starting to have students get on fire for God. They're having all-day worship services and prayer meetings, and it's breaking out in churches as well. We want to welcome this. When it comes, church, that's the time to jump in and flow with the Holy Ghost. We don't want to just experience it. We want to be part of the reason why it's happening. Prayer and fasting. God said, if my people humble themselves, turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven. Now let's every one of us be honest without looking to our left or to our right. Every one of us harbors some wicked ways that we need to change. There are some sins that are secret sins. There are some sins that you wear like a billboard. There are things that I often go to my father and say, you know what, this attitude isn't right, this behavior isn't right, I'm so sorry. Don't get defensive. I'm talking about me. If you fit into the same category, you can say amen. When we get defensive, we're putting up a shield, not the shield of faith, the shield of defiance. And it says, uh, I'm not going to let that get to me. If you want to have a move of God, take the shield down and say, I want that to get to me. The more we get honest and realize we need to clean up our act. We like to single out particular types of sin and say, oh, isn't that bad? And then we ignore the things in us that need to be put under the blood of Jesus and that we need to turn from. Don't think that because your sin is a private sin and nobody else knows about it, that demons don't know. Don't think that God doesn't know. And don't keep singing the same song like a broken record that says, well, I'm under grace. We are under grace. But grace will not be abused and grace will not be treated like a fool. Hello? God said, do not be fooled. God is not mocked. What we sow out of our lives, we will reap back. The grace of God is God's mercy that I don't deserve. But if I really understand that I don't deserve his mercy and I deliberately keep hiding my sins and doing the stuff I do and come along to grace and faith and put on my happy, clappy image and I never turn from and never deal with the issues in my life, I am calling God a fool. And I am treating his grace, which I never deserved in the first place, as if it's just secondhand old news. The Apostle Paul says, and I'm saying this because there is a a counterfeit grace has come into the church. It's a grace that says, well, you could live any way you want as soon as long as you've asked Jesus in your heart. The sins he forgave you of, you could keep living that way because now you're saved and you're under grace. God is not unjust. If it's wrong before you get saved, it's wrong after you get saved. It's very quiet. I'm preaching to me, so don't get offended. I'm talking to me. And if I happen to be talking to you, then you can give me an amen every so often. Look, we've got to get rid of our pride, our religious arrogance. We've got to get rid of this make-believe crap. Okay? And we need to get honest and be honest before God. And where our lives are not stacking up, seek counsel. Where our lives are not uh, stacking up, Repent. Tell God, hey, I I don't just feel bad for this. I want this to change. And when we get honest, God shows up. Hello? When we get honest, God shows up. 
So we had these series of dreams that revival was coming, and it, it's starting to hit. It's hit, but it's, it's increasing. About um, three months ago, I said to the pastoral staff, I said, listen, uh, we need to break out of this rut. Our parking lot is like an invisible ceiling. We can only park so many. You cannot seat in the auditorium more than what you can park out there. And God hasn't given us more land yet. I mean, we've been praying. I've been negotiating. I've been knocking on doors. I've been talking to the banks. We don't have more land yet. I said, so I refuse. Now, this is before revival broke out. I said, I refuse to continue in this vein. If you continue doing the same things you've always done and you expect different results, it's the definition of insanity. I said, so we're going to go to double services. Now, I shared with you in Vision 2020 towards the beginning of this year some of the goals we have, and I said to accomplish them, we're going to go to double services. And I decided uh, a good uh, probably eight weeks ago that for the month of April, we would begin our second service. This is what's going to happen. I thought we would build the church by doing this. The other day, as I was here with the musicians and they were practicing and worshiping, the Holy Spirit tapped me on the shoulder and said, revival has come. You are planning to create growth. I put that in your heart so you could catch the growth that's coming. Amen. Thank you for standing, Donna. Donna had a dream uh, just a week or so, two weeks or a week ago. And in this dream, she saw the whole earth was on fire. And at first she thought it was judgment. But as she was watching, her and Donna Johnson, I think it was, was in the dream. And uh, they're really happy and they're excited. And the whole earth is on fire. And people are trying to get away from it. And she said to Donna Johnson, she said that they think they can get away from it. But they don't realize the fire is going to get everyone. And when she woke up, she realized that's the fire of the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Revival is coming. Amen. We still believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit, prophecy, visions, dreams, words of knowledge. All the things that happened in the early church need to happen in this church. Amen. In every church. God said, I will pour out my spirit in those last days and young men will, prof uh, will see visions and young women will prophesy. Don't tell me the gifts are not for today when the prophet Joel said and Peter reiterated the prophecy, in the last days I will pour out my spirit and they will prophesy. These gifts are still for today, and thank you, Jesus, they are functioning where people let them function. Amen. And so I want to share with you just two things that are very important. One of them is going to be a little bit of a preach, uh, but I want to share with you, we, from time to time in the past, we do a thing called Miracles Happen. In this church, we believe in miracles. We have a young lady who, from the age of 16, uh, her name is Emma, her husband is Zach. Uh, from the age of 16, long before she met Zach, doctors told her and her parents she would never have a baby. It is impossible. She could not because of the internal disorder in her body. How old is your baby? Just over a year. So 18 months ago, <laughs> no, a little bit more than 18 months ago, Zach and Emma became pregnant with their first baby, and she is now just a little over a year, and am I allowed to say? They are with child again.
Where's Kim and Tina? Are they in the room? Stand up, guys. I, you know, for the men, I guess we can't appreciate this as much, but I'm sure women can. For 10 years, I believe you guys were trying to have a baby. Is that correct? And tried everything, and they could not have a baby. And shortly after Emma, Emma was with child, Tina and Kim also became pregnant with child, and they have a beautiful, beautiful little girl. <laughs> Amen. Thank you, guys. We believe in a God of miracles. He's not just concerned about our spiritual eternity. He's concerned with our day-to-day -day struggle. And he wants to invade earth. And revival is those times where God, in a, in a concentrated way, he starts to invade the earth. I realize that many people here have never seen a national, let alone worldwide, revival. We're heading into one now. Are you excited about this? Yeah, very much so. Things are happening that we have no control over. I'll give you an example. I went to the revival in Asbury because having been in other revivals, I know that you can go there and catch something spiritually and it will actually be released on your church. Uh, Juliet will share with you and bear witness. Stand up, Juliet. This happened in Australia. And uh, me and the senior leaders of the movement had gone away on a retreat. God came down. He blasted us in a wonderful way. Um, <clears throat> uh, I saw three open visions. In one of them, I got delivered from a spirit of rejection. Here I had 12 churches under me. I had pioneered uh, four of them. And uh, God set me free from a spirit of rejection. I come home. No one. This is before internet, before cell phones. No one in my church knew a thing. That Sunday morning, I said, if you want more God, come down the front. And the Holy Ghost blasted them. And we went through a period of a couple of years where in our prayer meetings, children were having visions. Adults were having visions, open visions. You could have a vision in here and you see these pictures. An open vision is when it's like you're watching a screen. It's happening out there. And kids would would be on the floor weeping and praying and crying, Jesus, save them. And as a pastor, afterwards, I would ask them, why were you crying out, Jesus, save my friends? They said, because we saw a vision of our friends going to hell. Listen, God wants to move in signs and wonders. And it's time for us to get our lives right and to start running after God. Because I'm telling you, the devil is running after America. If you love this country, and even if you don't, if you love yourself, then we need to get our hearts right. And you should love this country. And you should love every country. Because God loves everybody. Can I get an agreement? And God is getting ready to visit the nations. I believe we're right at the tail end, church. And isn't it just like God that before judgment comes, he will sweep the earth one more time with revival. Amen. Amen. And so in my mind, I thought, well, we're going to help this church grow. We're going to break this invisible ceiling. Since I don't have more parking, we'll go to two services. And we used to do this thing, or still do, called Miracle Happens, and We'll have a Sunday morning where we have a little bit of praise and worship, and I have a desk out the front and some red chairs, and I interview someone who's had a phenomenal miracle. We've had a prior ex-Klu Klux Klan leader, the head honcho who got born again, baptized in the Holy Ghost. He has since gone on to be with the Lord. But when he was the head of the Klu Klux Klan, he was on Phil Donahue's show. I'm dating myself. Some of you will remember. And they literally had to throw him off the show because he got so obnoxious. Well, that man found Jesus. He got born again, spirit-filled, and he was working in an all-black Christian denomination <laughs> as their evangelist. And we interviewed him here. 
uh, in our Miracle Happen show. And so we've, we've done this numerous times, and we would advertise, and the church would fill up for that occasion, and we would get anywhere from 10 to 20 people saved in a single service. And so I decided, you know, Easter's a time when people, even if they're not hungry for God, they show up. Last year, we sent out 10,000 mailers to a five-mile radius around the church. And for Easter, 300 people were in here. And for Palm Sunday, the Sunday before, 250 were here. So in my head, I'm thinking, okay, we're going to break this glass ceiling. We need to get more people saved. They need to hear the gospel. We'll go to two services. And we'll put on several Miracle Happens events, plus we'll celebrate Easter. And we will advertise, we'll send out the 10,000 flyers. Now, when I say flyer, this is what I'm talking about. We have printed these in the past. Uh, this is advertising a gentleman named Don Piper. He wrote a book. They made a movie about his story, 90 Minutes in Heaven. He, he died in a, a fatal truck crash. He was driving a small car over a bridge, and a truck ran over the top of him. He was dead. Huge line of cars backed up. They, in that state, they're not allowed to move the body unless the coroner comes and issues a certificate of death and time and place. And so traffic was backed up. But there was a Baptist convention. He had been at the Baptist convention. He was coming home. In that long line was another pastor. Well, I won't tell you any more of the story. <laughs> We've had him here before. We're going to have him the Sunday after Easter. And so we send out flyers like this. We're about to send out 10,000 flyers, and they advertise all the special events. We're going to print up extra of these so that you could give them out. We want to lead people to Jesus Christ. We are very serious about getting souls saved. We're very serious about discipling them. Many who were baptized today are in our discipleship class. And by the way, if you are in the discipleship class, make sure you finish each lesson. And when you finish the last lesson, you get the leather Bible cover and everything else, more than just the Bible and the notebook that we gave you. So 10,000 of these are going to go out. The Palm Sunday, stand up, Tina. Where is Tina? Tina Cook, where are you? All right, Tina's here, your sister. What's your first name again? Charlotte. Would you stand up? Charlotte is a medical doctor. She, I don't think she had her doctorate at the time. She has since become a medical doctor. Tina and her husband, Brian, were diving. They are avid divers. When she was told to jump in the water, the um, captain had not shut the engine off. It sucked her in. It severed two arteries. You don't know her story, but you're going to find out on Palm Sunday. We're going to interview Charlotte and Tina and Brian. We have some photos that are very graphic, and I'm going to give people a warning. Don't watch if you're squeamish. She should be dead. Tina used to come to this church but was not really committed to Jesus. She had questions. But while she was pinned to the boat and literally not lacerated, deeply severed parts of her, her limbs. The water filled with blood. They thought they were going to jump in and just recover a body. God came to her under the boat and put her in a bubble. She went from agony to absolute peace. Okay? You'll hear the whole story. You'll hear the whole story on Palm Sunday. But that's going to be featured in this flyer. Then we have Easter. I appreciate the tears. Uh, you know, Tina still hasn't looked at the photo. She doesn't want to. Her sister has. And they're pretty, they're extremely horrific, aren't they? Extremely horrific. But what an amazing miracle. You'll hear the whole story. I want you to invite your friends. I do. 
because there's an anointing on this house to get people saved. Amen. Amen. That's Palm Sunday. Then Easter Sunday, we'll celebrate Easter and take communion. The Sunday after Easter is Resurrection Sunday. The following Sunday, we have a resurrection story of a man who was in heaven for 90 minutes and was brought back to life. Then following that, the following Sunday, uh, we have uh, Bruce Van Natta, a semi-trailer truck, the cab, fell on him and squashed his midsection to two inches. He came out of his body and he saw two nine-foot angels holding him. Miraculously, again, his arteries were seven and five places to this day medically the records show that no one has ever survived five severations or uh, cuts through their arteries a miracle took place you're going to hear his story he's going to be here in person and then the very last Sunday, Dr. Tom Renfro's coming back down, and we're going to interview him. You saw the video of all the tumors all over his body and how God healed him. 10,000 homes. On average, that's 30 to 40,000 people will receive these flyers. I thought we were going to two services to try to make the church grow. I'm convinced now. God's planning to bring growth one way or the other. Amen. I say all that to say this. The first service will start at 9 a.m. We won't have a nursery and we won't have a children's church or youth. People who, uh, like Joe and Bonnie, your kids are grown up, Great service. People like Wesley and, and Jazz, they're not married yet. Young people, good time to attend. Obviously, people with little kids, you're going to prefer to go to the second service. Why don't we have children's church and nursery? Because not enough people have volunteered yet to serve. That's the truth. We could use three times more workers than what we have. Everybody wants revival and everyone would like to get their surfboard out and ride the waves of revival. But you need workers to sustain revival. Okay? So we're going to do what we can at the moment. And so we're doing a, an early service at 9 a.m. There'll be a half hour break and then an 11 a.m. service. And I am convinced that by the end of April, both services will be near full, if not full. I believe that. I'm believing for a minimum of 30 souls to get saved and maybe even more than 50. That's what I believe during the month of April alone. But I believe that this will continue like this because revival is here. I need people to volunteer. Just running two services, even without the nursery and children's church and youth, we need so much more people in the parking lot. We need so much more people on the doors. We need so many more gatherers. We need more ushers. Hang on. If I haven't made it clear, I need you. Amen. Revival is not a spectator sport. Revival is every one of God's kids becoming revived and doing what they wouldn't do before. I maintain in this church, and it starts with me, there is no job beneath me. None. I routinely will clean the bathrooms myself, and I'm not ashamed to say it. There is no job beneath me, and there's nothing above me. There's nothing too big. Because I can do all things through Jesus Christ. Amen. The stuff that would seem too big, we all love to say, yes, Philippians, yeah, I can do all things through Jesus Christ. But how many of you will say, yeah, Jesus said, take up your cross, I'll do the stuff that normally would be beneath me. 
I do need nursery workers. I, number one, when this happens, we won't have enough for the second service. I need nursery workers. I need children's workers. I need youth workers. I need people in the parking lot. I need people on the doors. I need greeters. And I need a church that will show up on time. Because often, first-time visitors are on time while the rest of the church lags behind. You know it. You know it. If you've been a first-time visitor, you know it. Don't copy the rest of the church. We want to copy you. We want to catch up to you. We want our love to become like our first love again. Come on. I didn't get enough amens. That was too meek and mild. I said we want our love for Jesus to be like our first love. Absolutely. He doesn't deserve anything less. He doesn't deserve for us to come off the honeymoon. He will never come off the honeymoon. We do. He will never come off the honeymoon. We do. And so there are serve cards in the chair in front of you. Now, this isn't a long-winded announcement. I'm preaching. There are serve cards in front of you in every chair. I need you today to fill it out and give it to one of the pastors. We are stretching our wings. The Bible says extend the tent cords and push the tent pegs out. That's what we're doing. But tent pegs are people. And the cords are a team working together in unity. If we're going to accommodate a move of God, then every one of us have got to move with God. Thank you, Pastor Steve. I will. If we're going to accommodate a move of God, then every one of us have to move with God. Every one of us. Those serve cards are blue and white or teal and white. Fill it in today. We'll find a spot for you. There's nothing beneath you and nothing above you. There's nothing beneath me and nothing above me. We can do all things and we will do all things for the sake of the kingdom of God. Good preaching, Pastor Rob. Amen. We only have a few weeks to get this together. The printers are already printing these up and they're going to go into every house in in the zip codes in a five mile radius. I need your support. I am intent on not missing the move of the Holy Spirit. And I am intent on leading as many people to Jesus Christ as we can. Absolutely. Now, next week I'm going to preach on how to grow your spirit. And I will give you tangible steps from the scriptures. But this morning I'm going to preach for about 10 minutes on the book of Joel on chapter 2. If you have your Bible open to the book of Joel. On the day of Pentecost, Jesus, when he ascended to heaven, he told his disciples, don't leave Jerusalem till you receive the promise that I've talked to you about that my father has promised. Don't leave till you get it. And when you get it, it will fill you with power. On the day of Pentecost... From 500 people, over 500 who witnessed Jesus' resurrection, the discipleship number dropped by the time the Holy Spirit came to 120. There was 120 in the upper room, but over 500 witnessed his resurrection. Where did the rest go? As for me... And my house, and this is the attitude I had when I was raising the children. When we were raising our kids, our attitude was, as for us and our household, we will serve the Lord. Amen. Joel, when the Holy Ghost came, wind blew through the place and a a tongue If you've ever seen your tongue or an ox tongue, tongues fell on everybody's head. And those tongues were on fire. 
And then the wind came. And you know what wind does with fire? It spreads the fire. Think about the symbolism. They all started to speak in tongues. Now, I've been preaching a series about your first step to your greatest successes. And the key is learning how to say, not my will, not my way, God, your will, your way. I've been teaching how our body, our physical flesh, our body, and our soul get in the way. Last week I shared with you that when Jesus said the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak, the word willing, prothesmos, means the spirit, your spirit, is always inclined to do the will of God. But my soul and my physical body is filled with the knowledge of good and evil. It's not always inclined to do the will of God. And so I have to learn how to live more from my spirit so that I don't satisfy the bad or evil knowledge that comes to the soul and to the body. How many of you know what I'm talking about? You can tell on yourself a little bit here, okay? When the Holy Ghost came, why did God do that? Tell them I'll be there in a minute. Everybody wants me. What can I tell you? Uh, why did God do that? Why did he put tongues that are, were on fire on their heads and then make their tongues pray in another language? Because God wanted to baptize us with his spirit so that we learn how to live from our spirit following his spirit instead of living from our natural mind and our natural emotions and our flesh. The greatest key to your success is learning how to live from your spirit. It's called divine order. You are spirit, soul, body. And when tongues appeared on their head and it was on fire and the wind came and they started to pray in tongues, God was bringing back divine order. It's spirit first then soul, then body. Are you hearing me? Peter, thank you. Peter gets up and he says, look, what's happening, God prophesied about through the prophet Joel. And he quotes the prophet Joel. So I'm going to take you to the prophet Joel. Peter re reiterates the fact that Joel said in the last days, God will pour out his spirit on all flesh. And young men will see visions. Young women will prophesy. My spirit will come on everyone. Old men will have dreams, divine dreams. Hey, guys, God intends that his church lives from the spirit, not from their body and their soul. Our spirit needs to be in control, not our flesh. When my flesh is in control, that's when you will see the worst of Rob Scarello. And when my spirit is in control, that's when you'll see the best of Rob Scarello. And most of us are like the rest of us. And everyone said, Amen. that's the truth. All right. So I'm going to read from Joel. But I'm going to read a few verses before Joel talks about the Spirit of God coming and gifts falling on people and prophecy and visions and dreams. There's always something that precedes a move of God. God is starting to move. How many of you want it to really hit in Tampa Bay? How many of you want it to really hit in this church as well? God forbid it comes to Tampa Bay and we're not open. So I want to read the verses preceding the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Joel chapter 2, verse 12 to 13. I'm only going to be a couple of minutes. Now therefore, says the Lord, turn to me with all your heart. Why didn't he just say turn to me with your heart? Because our heart is very divided and you could be half-hearted with God. And God won't accept half-heartedness. 
He says, turn to me with all of your heart. Because that's very important. When God doesn't have all of our heart, it means the devil has some of it. The devil has entertained our flesh, our body, our soul. And he has put little strongholds inside of us. Let's get honest. Juan, you're a man. Dave, you're a man. You're good men. I love your attitude in this church. Let's be honest. There are things in us that still need to change. There are things in all of us that we still need to repent of and say, God, I got to get this right. Don't take offense. Take direction from the Holy Spirit. Because as we get our hearts right and we get serious with how we live our Christianity, God will get serious with how he shows up in the church. You're thinking about it? Okay, I'm going to think about it. Maybe I should start this message from the beginning. You see, God will put in as much as we put in. And so when we get honest and we realize, okay, you want me to get honest? You want me to get honest? Okay, I'm going to get honest. You got to stop lying. You got to stop putting yourself first. Oh, I would never put myself before God. You do when you put yourself before everybody else because everybody else is created in the image of God. You didn't see that coming, did you? You got to stop looking at pornography. He said that in church? Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to say a lot of things in church. We need to be real. Come on. We need to be honest. We got to stop playing church. Stop making believe you're spiritual. Me too. What I say to you, I say to me. And I have brought myself before the Lord, and I'm going to continue to bring myself before the Lord. I want to live right. I want to live godly. I want a Holy Ghost move in this church and in this city. Can I get an agreement? Stop living for your business or for your work or for the American dollar. Oh, well, my ministry is my job. Well, then if your ministry really is your job, then pursue it, but pursue it with the goal of putting as much back into the kingdom of God. And if that isn't your goal, then really you're just pursuing another idol. A lot of people use the excuse of ministry in their business, and really they're just hiding and disguising another idol. Seek first the kingdom of God. You know, it dawned on me this morning. I've been preaching about divine order. When Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and all these other things will fall into place, what was he talking about? Divine order. Divine order. When Jesus said to a young man who said, how do I get to heaven? He said, thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all of your mind, and then love your neighbor as yourself. What's he talking about? Divine order. Why, did he, why didn't he just say you should love God and love your neighbor as yourself? No, he said love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, because you could love God and not have all your heart in it. Why does he say here, turn to me with all your heart? Because you can be half-hearted about it. And every time the church of Jesus Christ, and the church is not the institution, and the church is not the clergy, they're part of the church, but you are as much a part of that church. And I don't think for one minute I'm any better than anyone else. I am saved by the same grace that covers my sin that covers your sin. Can I get a better amen than that? I'm as broken as the next person, but I thank God that God looks at me as the righteousness of Christ. But while he does, I am not going to take advantage of that and live like a fool. I'm not going to take advantage of that and keep dabbling in sin. I'm not going to take advantage of the fact that God in his goodness treats me like a son while I live like a demon. Every one of us, and this, this, 
I'm not preaching condemnation. God loves us. And I have seen people fail miserably, and the moment they get serious and they turn to Jesus, God loves them amazingly. Even when they knew better. And guess what? Kenya, I fit into that description. I've done a lot of stupid things after I've known better. I'm not the preacher because I've got a perfect record. I'm the preacher because God called me and my record is washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. Are you hearing me, church? Come on. But it's time for us to be honest. It's time for us to be real. We need a move of God. We want a move of God. I thank God this church is doing awesome. But compared to what God can do, I want more. Everybody say, I want more. Absolutely. I'm calling everyone, everyone to repentance. Repentance isn't a dirty word. The world and the church, because of the world's attitude, we cringe and we sort of think, yeah, can we find another word? No, repentance, 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 repentance. <laughs> I'm going to tell you why devils hate the word repentance. Because when we take areas of secret sin and we put it under the blood of Jesus and we say, no more, I'm not going there anymore, another demon lost a battle. He lost ground in you and in me. And so they hate repentance because honestly, repentance is the foundation to revival. I'm going to say it again. Repentance is the foundation to revival. And if that's not true, then God doesn't know his stuff. Because God prophesied 500 years before through Isaiah, and he prophesied that he would send the Messiah to save the world, but before he sends the Messiah, he will send one in the wilderness to prepare the way of the Lord. And John the Baptist came, and he prepared the spiritual climate. What did he do? Man, he lost his head over it. Literally, he was decapitated for his message. But literally, what God prophesied 500 years before was that somebody would have backbone enough and guts enough and spiritual maturity enough to come into a very religious world and tell it as it really is. And some people will get upset, but other people will repent. And God knew that before the Messiah could come to bring salvation, before there could be a Jesus revival, there had to be a John the Baptist come to Jesus revival come on learn the patterns of God and if you don't learn the patterns then just imitate what God does you'll be on a good track what does he do he sends a prophet and he says come on Israel come on all you Hebrew people you're so proud of the fact that you're sons of Abraham but you're not sons of Abraham just because you're born uh, Geonetically, uh, according to Abraham, you're sons of Abraham if you obey God. John the Baptist called people to turn around and think serious about their lives and get their act cleaned up. And according to Jesus, even Pharisees were coming and getting baptized by John. And then, when there was a revival of repentance... There was a revival of Jesus. You know what happened in the Jesus movement? Hippies dropping acid and religious clean cut people in suits and ties started to repent of their sins and confess to each other, apologize for having bad attitudes or racial attitudes. America was in a, man, it was a mess. The same kind of racial tension we're seeing coming to the head now was coming to the head then. We had political leaders that had lied and deceived the nation. We had assassinations. The president was assassinated. His brother was assassinated a few years later. We had the Bay of Pigs mess up. 
As a nation, we were lied to, and our young people got so fed up with the lies of the clean-cut generation that wasn't so clean. They grew their hair long. They stopped taking baths and showers. They started dropping acid, smoking marijuana, rolling reefers, listening to their rock and roll, and having sex with anyone, male, female, or whatever. And that's where America was politically and morally, spiritually. And the only reason why we survived that was there were some people who were praying and God pressed a reset button. He answered their prayers and there was a great revival. I'm telling you, it hit us in Australia as well. It did. It hit us in Australia. We used to send away to America and buy the Jesus People USA newspapers and we'd go through our school witnessing to kids and churches were filling up even then. But it starts with repentance. So I make no apology. Joel says, now therefore says the Lord, turn to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping. I started to share how when you fast, you're obeying your spirit and denying your physical body. Your body wants to eat. My body loves to eat. In fact, I love to eat so much I learned how to cook. So now I'm my own chef. I have my own chef wherever I go. That's how much I enjoy food. I love to eat. Fasting says, you know what? That is an absolute essential, but I'm going to put that to the side. You won't die. You've stored enough. <laughs> and I'm going to hunger in my spirit instead. My soul wants, I love movies. I love to escape. Work gets so heavy. I love to watch a movie and just escape for an hour or two. Fasting is saying to the soul, the soul wants to learn new adventures, new dramas. The emotions want to feel excitement, horror, romance. I say to my soul, no, I'm not feeding you from Netflix today. I'm not feeding you from the AMC theater today. I'm not watching the news. Oh, how my mind loves to get into the news and all the conspiracy theories. Shut up. My body and my soul, the mind of the intellect and my soul and the mind of my emotions and my soul are going to submit to my spirit as my spirit is predisposed to follow God. I'm going to fast. It's not a hunger strike. I'm going to fast, and I'm going to fill myself with worship. I'm going to fill myself with reading the word. I'm going to fill myself with praying. You see here, God says, turn to me with all your heart, fasting and weeping with mourning. Don't rend. Uh, he says, rend your heart, not your garments. Don't let it be make-believe. God's the first one who's not a hypocrite. God's the first one who hates a phony. Now, if a phony repents, he'll love that person. But come on, too often the church is stigmatized by the reality that people are phonies. I'm running this church, hopefully by the Holy Ghost. And I'm telling every one of us, let's get really real. Let's get really honest. I think the best compliment I get on my preaching is, man, you're so transparent. You're so real. That's how God wants all of us to be. Okay? You can't be shacking up on the side. You can't be stealing. You can't be robbing from your work. You can't be lying. You can't be cursing night and day. You can't be ha eating and living on a digest of 40 shades of gray or whatever the heck it is. We've got to clean up our act. You can't watch the devil's entertainment and really expect to be full of the Holy Ghost at the same time. Come on, let's be honest. Oh, it's okay. Oh, it, it won't matter. Well, just a little bit. It only takes a little bit of yeast to make the whole batch of dough blow up. I must have had yeast for breakfast. Rend your heart, not your garments. Return 
to the Lord your God. He's gracious. He's merciful. He's slow to anger. You don't hear me shouting and screaming. I'm not trying to condemn anyone or scare anyone. I'm talking like a big, cuddly daddy. Come on, kids. He's slow to anger. And he, he is of great kindness, and he relents from doing harm. God doesn't want to judge anybody. And right after that, that's verse 12 to 13, verse 28 to 30, and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour on my spirit on all flesh. You see repentance, and then God pours out his spirit. Are you seeing that? Pastor Rob, you realize you said stuff that could offend people here today? I would rather offend you and tell you the truth in love so that you could get right than make you smile and laugh and take your tithes and offerings and know you're going back to your car the same way you came in. After the prophet Joel talks about repentance, he says, and it shall come to pass. This is God talking, by the way. Afterwards, it will come to pass. I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. And also on my men servants and my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. I'm done preaching. This Wednesday night, I'm calling the church to fast. And we're coming here to worship and pray. You're right. You don't have to come. I don't have to come. I want to come. It is to my advantage to be here. It is to your advantage to be here. So Wednesday night, we're not going to host a revival going Sunday to Sunday. No, we're going to get together Wednesday night, 7 o'clock, and I encourage you to fast all day. And between now and Wednesday, get honest with God and get with God and say, I need to clean this up. I'm sorry for this. I'm sorry for that. Because if we're going to have a revival, God comes on the back of honesty and transparency. Yeah, I know that what I'm preaching today isn't quite as exciting as last week, but it's more important. I know I'm not jumping on chairs and you're not jumping and shouting like last week, but this is really important. This is the key and the foundation to having a move of God in our lives. You know, last week, out of the blue, 22 first-time visitors showed up. No guest speaker, no advertising. Nine people got saved, seven in here and two in the youth. Amen. The numbers skyrocketed. Nothing special, but I went to catch revival and I brought it home. I can't describe it. It's supernatural. But it's starting to float amongst us. Breathe in. Breathe in and say, God, I want it. Do you know, three, I think it was three Tuesday nights, the first Tuesday I was home from a revival, I had a really tough evening. And I had to see a couple of people. I came here. They're practicing. And I'm walking up and down. This is the God's honest truth. And I realize some of you might not believe me. But because it's the truth, I'm going to say it anyway. It's the truth. And I live by the truth. I don't make stuff up. And so I'm having a, you know, it was a rough night, rough day. And I'm just worshiping. And they're finishing up practice. I smell something really sweet and beautiful. And the only female song leader here for that practice was Patrice. The only other female on the platform was Juliet. And I go up to Patrice, and they're singing, they're practicing, and I start sniffing. <laughs> I wanted to find out if it was her perfume. Now, she did have perfume on, but it wasn't the same smell. And so then and she's looking at me, you know. I go to Juliet, and I start sniffing. This is the honest truth. If I'm a liar, the whole, the whole worship team will know I'm lying. I went to Michael. I went to Izzy. I went to Michael. I went to Pastor Steve. I went to 
uh, Kim. And I couldn't smell the smell. So I come back down here and I continue to worship and I'm smelling it here, there. It would lift and it comes down again. A beautiful smell. It wasn't in your face, but it was there. So I motioned to Pastor Carlos. I didn't tell him what was going on. He comes down. I put my arm around him. I said, I'm smelling a fragrance. I think it's coming from God. I said, walk with me. We walked up and down, and we could not smell it. And in my head, I said, Father, Pastor Carlos messed it up. <laughs> the minute he and I separated, he smelt it. I smelt it. And then instead of walking up and down, I said, I'm going to stand here in this fragrance and just breathe it in. And so I started breathing in quickly, and I was getting almost a little dizzy. And I'm holding on to that fragrance. I knew it was the presence of God. Suddenly, Pastor Carlos' wife, Liz, comes out of the sound booth, and she walks down the front. She said, I smelt it in the sound booth. I learned Several days later, she smelt it before me. So it wasn't me putting a mental suggestion there. She smelt it, and she asked her daughter, did you wash your hands with that citrus-smelling soap? Because she smelt a sweet blossom. And she ended up coming out the front. Then the whole worship team started to smell it, and they were at the end of practice, and suddenly... We went into the most beautiful time of worship. Supernatural things happen when God is moving. I can't dictate what's going to happen. All I can say is God let it all happen. Come on, stand with me. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Now, look at me. The first step, the first step to coming back to God is coming to Jesus and letting him come into your heart. I want every eye closed right now. If we can just hold it for a moment, every eye closed. Every eye closed. If you have never asked Jesus Christ into your heart, if you've never asked Jesus in your heart, it's time to say, hey, I'm broken. I've messed up. We've all messed up. I need Jesus. God doesn't come with a baseball bat. Joel said he's merciful and slow to anger. Today, you need to make that decision to let Jesus come into your heart. I'm not asking you to join a church. I'm asking you to let Jesus come in your life. Say yes to a relationship with the God of the universe. Maybe years ago you did it when you were a kid. And like many of us, you got into all sorts of things. I get it. I've done it. It's time to come home and say, Jesus Christ, come into my heart now I'm sorry I want to start life with you so raise your hand right now if the spirit of God's talking to you and you want to ask Jesus in your heart if you want to accept Christ in your heart raise your hand right now nice and tall put your hand up I see a hand up the back thank you sir you can put it down come on raise your hand church who wants to say yes to Jesus? I see two ladies here. Thank you. You can put your hands down. I see a young man here. Thank you. Who else? Raise your hand nice and high and say, I want Jesus Christ to come into my heart. I don't care how many churches you belong to. I don't care how many candles you light at mass. I don't care how many scriptures you know by heart. Are you walking with Jesus? Have you asked him in your heart? I don't care what you've done wrong. I really don't care. God doesn't care. As long as you're willing to say, I'm sorry. Jesus, come into my life. Friend, you're not bad enough for God to turn away. God sent his son the biggest thing he had to pay the price for the biggest of sins and the biggest of sinners. 
So I don't care what your past has been like. I care about you and what you went through in your past. But the size of your sin cannot keep you away from the size of God's love. Come on, if you haven't raised your hand yet and you know you need to, you know the Spirit of God is urging you. Come on, put your hand up one last time. Say yes to Jesus if you haven't done so already. All right, about four or five people somewhere in there. I want the whole church to repeat after me. And if you raised your hand, then a simple childlike prayer that's just like God. You're not even prejudiced to whether you're a kid or a grown-up, educated or not educated. He makes it simple. A simple childlike prayer. Repeat after me if you raise your hand and mean it from your heart. I want the whole church to repeat. Dear God, I know you love me. I welcome you. I need you. I've messed up. There's been sin in my life. I want you. Jesus Christ to come down and live inside of me walk with me talk with me lead me Jesus I need you and I accept you and I ask you to forgive me of my sins and live with me and help me to live with you the rest of my life. Father God, I thank you that you have so much love that you can accept me. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for hearing my prayer. And everyone said, Amen. 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 If you just prayed that prayer, I am so serious about making disciples for Jesus. You saw some of that today. We have a seven-week discipleship class straight after church. We feed you for free. We give you a Bible for free. We give you the discipleship book for free. When you've gone through every lesson, we give you a leather Bible cover and some extra glossy covered brochures and notes. Awesome, really good stuff. In fact, people in the church have seen it and they've been asking me, can I buy it? I want one. Can I buy it? It's free if you ask Jesus in your heart and you do the class. I encourage you, you could join us today. If you have other arrangements, come back next week, join the class. This is important. It's not a one-moment, split-second deal. Oh, he comes into your heart in a split second. And you're forgiven in a split second. But I want to learn how to walk with Jesus. And that's what discipleship's all about. Amen. 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 We're going to close. I encourage as many of you, if not all of you, come out Wednesday night, 7 o'clock sharp. We're going to have worship, and we're going to pray. And we're going to ask God, move in this church, move in this city. We want a Holy Ghost revival. Amen. Amen. Do me a favor. Look around. Turn around right now. Look around. If you've been here at least eight weeks, you know this place is already growing. No advertising. The Spirit of God is moving and calling people. Now, Father, bless them as they go their way. I thank you that four or five people raised their hand today. And today, in Jesus' name, they are born again. Today, their sins are forgiven. I thank you the blood of Jesus covers them now. And today, they are sons and daughters of God. Holy Spirit, come inside of them right now. Fill them with your presence. Fill them with the love of Jesus. And we break chains off of people who said yes today. We break demonic strongholds where demons have held people in bondage. I break it in Jesus name and we release people into the fullness of being the children of God I thank you in Jesus name and everyone said Amen. come on give the Lord a huge shout yeah thank you Jesus
Turn around, hug someone on your way out, give them a fist pump, a high five, an air hug, or a bear hug. I'll see you guys next week, but I'll see you Wednesday night. God bless you, church. God is moving.